basically looked at the preparation for immunology uh, laboratory uh, tests. Specifically, we talked about serological tests. And uh, the objectives that I said yesterday are not far away from what we are going to look at. Just to remind you, we looked at uh, having the understanding of the following that you should be able to list different types of serological tests, the principles involved, and the applications. And also, you can identify the advantages vis a vis the disadvantages for each test. And lastly, Maybe you may be interested to know the factors that may affect the assays, that is, serological tests. Now, in an art cell, we'll maybe focus on the main ones, the main tests, which are based on certain principles. Now, we look at the primary binding sites, the secondary binding sites, and tertiary binding sites. So, to start us off, we had talked about the issue of serology, that is antigen antibody tests, and I'm not going to repeat so much on what we had looked at yesterday. But in principle, when some uh, when a patient is in, in, in infected or has something foreign in the body, the body will produce immune response. We may not see this immune response, but we can detect based on production of antibodies against these antigens, and we must use also the help of the uh, diagnostics or immunodiagnostic for that reason we need the reagents that can help us to visualize this particular uh, 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 complex antigen and complexes that are formed now one of the sources of getting these complexes we get blood from the patient then we allow this blood that is on a plain tube normally the red tube and then you centrifuge once the blood has clotted what you get is a clear separation of debris, that is the immobilized cells, as well as the clean um, as a solution, which we call now as serum, after the blood has already clotted. Now, as I said yesterday, this interaction between antigen and antibody is reversible. So whenever you have an excess of either antibody or antigen, it can always revert back to the original state. So it is reversible, especially when you talk about in about the condition. But in vivo, that is in the actual host, these antigen antibody interactions can attract or um, precipitate certain reactions for the immune cells. And we, we know very well from your even second year that opsonization, that is when you find there is activated phagocytosis because there is an antigen that uh, uh, is coded by an antibody and this is, makes the immune cells from the innate immune cells to recognize that. And also it enables for the clearance and we have certain cells like macrophages that probably comes to clear those uh, complexes. But above all this, the, the position of these immunocomplexes sometimes causes inflammatory response because of this attraction of the immune cells. And that's why sometimes you have to get this chronic uh, conditions where you have continuous deposition of these antigen antibody complexes. Okay. Now, um, the immunological techniques that we look at today uh, will be based on this uh, concept that uh, you have the binding of an antigen, and you need to be very keen to differentiate between certain aspects that I'm, I'm going to discuss. First, there is the issue of direct and indirect. Now, whenever you have any direct test, meaning you are detecting the presence of one particular uh, component of an antigen or the entire antigen directly. So if I'm looking at a viral in, in infection, I can stain maybe to get the background. I can look for the, the morphology of these virus. If it's a bacteria, I can uh, detect the presence of an antigen or the DNA or the, the coating of this uh, bacteria. So the issue is that you must detect one of the component of the actual uh, pathogen. But in direct tests, you don't need to look at the component of the pathogen, but rather you look at the products that are produced due to the presence of this pathogen. For example, the antibodies 
antibodies are just produced by the immune cells, but their presence indicates the presence of an infection. So that is what we see. So in primary binding uh, tests, we can look at the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, that's ELISA. We have the radio, radio amino assays, which utilizes radioisotopes. We have the Western protein and the fluorescence tests. Then uh, primary binding tests, these are widely used in serological diagnosis of bacteria, viral infections, fungal and parasitic infections. And these are usually sensitive and they give reproducible results, meaning you can use it anywhere for the same pathogen and you can detect it. Now, immunofluorescence tests, that is the one we start with. These are two types. You can talk about direct and indirect. So like I said earlier on, we talk about direct, which means you are going to detect part of the entire pathogen. And for you to detect, you need something like it can give you, or which will give you a signal. In that case, if you are looking at an antigen itself, you need an antibody that will bind to that particular antigen that you are investigating. Now, the direct fluorescent uh, antibody tests, this utilizes the, uh, the, the, the dyes that are very important in identification. And these dyes, sometimes they absorb light, but when they get excited, they emit more light, and that enables to be seen under dark uh, background, maybe under the immunofluorescent uh, microscope. So that is what happens. So the most commonly used fluorochrome or dye that is used for immunofluorescent assays, it is fluorescent isothiocyanate, which is abbreviated as FITC, which gives yellow green uh, fluorescence whenever subjected to UV light. So this uh, fluorescent substance is one that when absorbing light, like I've said, emits light of another wavelength, and this is more compared to its, its own when it's not excited under a UV light. Now, the procedure, whenever you have this antigen, sometimes you can have like a tissue that is infected, with a pathogen, a bacteria, or a virus, this tissue, you can cut it into sections and probably stain it. And if the antigen is there, like for example, immunohistochemistry utilizes the principle of antigen input interaction as well as the acid basic uh, phenomena. So in that case, you are combining two principles, but at the end of the day, you want to visualize the antibody and you know the dyes the basic dyes and the basic dyes will also do their part in terms of the, the imparting the color that is relevant to our CD or basic component. This, once you have this uh, staining, then you can do the washing. You can remove an excess and bound antibody. And this is enhanced by dark field illumination under microscope with UV source. So in that way, you can visualize this um, uh, reaction and sometimes people can preserve the, 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 the positive cases just for teaching and, and for reference purposes. Then uh, the direct fluorescent antigen uh, test, this um, can be used to identify bacteria when the numbers are very low, and it may be also be used to detect viruses in uh, tissue, um, in tissue culture or tissues from infected animals. So, like I've said, the basic principle is antigen antibody interaction, and then you need to use a dye that is able to absorb light and the UV source gets excited or emits more lights that can be able to visualize. Then, indirect fluorescent uh, antibody test. This one, in, as opposed to looking at the antigen itself, it can utilize the and labeled antibody which combines with an antigen and the antigen antibody complex is also detected in the, 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 the background. So here you are looking at uh, an antibody that can be able to interact with an antigen. So in this case, what you have, or the unknown you are looking is that you have an antigen, but you want to use the antibody that can 
bind with that particular antigen. But in the in, in, in direct, you use an antibody to capture the antigen itself. So those are the differences between indirect and the direct tests. And the, the visualization part is very key. Know that you are using UV source so that you can subject this um, uh, 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 tissue or the, the slide that has the antigen antibody reaction. And you need the help of a microscope to see this uh, uh, lighting or fluorescence that for that reason. Yeah, let's move to the next slide. Um, some of the radio uh, uh, or the, the, the components that can be used to, to bring this uh, um, the reaction into visualization, you need to have them in a device. So know that you have your UV source, know that you have your microscope, and then you are ready to go. So that is it. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm making a summary of this uh, slide, so that's why I'm moving that speed. So the slide that showing you the reaction, you can see the principle of immunofluorescence that whenever you have an antigen antibody interaction, then you can visualize this because one of it has been labeled with FITC uh, component and that makes it excited under UV source and you can see the greenish um, spots that tells you that is a positive test for that particular uh, investigation. And the examples where this technique can be applied it are given for some viral infections and, and this can be um, utilized, especially whenever you find the facilities are available. So it, they are good on their own because sometimes you, you may miss to isolate these um, pathogens or antigens from their source if it's a tissue, like somebody who has died and you want to go back and see what caused the disease. So sometimes this can help you to troubleshoot even from doing histological investigations for that matter. Then immunofluorescence applications, one of the advantages is they are sensitive and specific and they can be used um, they can be used in discrete uh, discrepant uh, analysis, like when there's disputes or sometimes one test gives these results and another one is negative. So this comes like a type rate just to confirm. Then limitations, of course, that uh, it's very expensive. We've been looking at the issue of equipment, microscope, immunoports and microscope are very expensive. And also the cost of reagents are also not cheap. Then there is chance of closely activity when the antigens share some epitopes. So sometimes you need a more sensitive uh, technique to give out the results. And sometimes it has been shown to be non-specific immunofluorescence. So, and also it takes um, one day. So that is all about immunofluorescence uh, technique. Now let's come to the main technique that you can find in any lab that does serology enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, which is very common in diagnosing microbial infections. And this technique, like I said yesterday, ELISA is highly specific and highly sensitive, meaning it has to be almost 99.9% 9 .9 sensitive and specific. And if you sample the kits in the common clinical laboratories you can find, they have written the sensitivity of each kit as well as the specificity of a particular kit. And mostly they range between 99.9 .9 or 98.9, but usually it's 99.9. .9. That tells you there's no kit that will be 100% effective. So you need to know that. Now the results of ELISA can be in two ways. It can be qualitative, meaning you are looking at whether the antigen is present or not, or sometimes it can be quantitative, meaning you need to find out the concentrations for a particular infection, especially those that are endemic infections that their mere detection of presence or absence is not, does not make sense unless you find the titers or the concentrations. And in that case, 
the quantitative becomes a diagnostic test, especially when somebody has rain infections. And I've said like typhoid, we always have these endemic infections and people always look at for different antigens and they look at the, the, the titers or the concentrations for them to make whether this person is having a rain infection or not. Now, there are two main ways of performing ELISA techniques. You can use double antibody technique or in a single terms direct, or you can use indirect technique to detect an assay antibody. And just remember I mentioned when it's direct, you are looking one component or the entire component that is the antigen itself or the pathogen. Now, in direct tests, specific antibodies coded on the surface of the wall. Now, why specific antibodies coded? This antibody will combine or react with an antigen if the antigen under investigation is present in patient sample. And that is why if you code an antibody, it is going to bind with an antigen. So it can bind with one component of an antigen, and that's why I'm saying if this is a direct test. So you have that antibody that is already coated on the plate, and finally, then you get your sample introduced to that plate. What happens if there is an antigen present? It will bind with an antibody, and then you allow some time, usually like one hour, 30 minutes, for this antigen antibody interaction to take place. Then after, you need to wash. The reason why you are washing is that you want to remove excess unbound antigen, and then you introduce the second antibody, which is anti-human, so that uh, it, 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 it defines and, and it gives you the, 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 it's usually bound with an enzyme, so this enzyme is very critical in the next step that you require to add a substrate, which will be converted by this enzyme into a different product. And finally, a color change will be observed. And the intensity of this color can be equated with the amount of the antigen that is originally present from the sample that you, you got from the patient. So if you don't see any color change, that means there was no antigen present and then there's nothing that formed in terms of antigen and food complex. And finally, what you have is a negative test. There's no color change, nothing, everything clear. And each test usually has the manufacturer instructions in terms of calculating the results. You must check with your negative has to meet certain conditions, maybe 0 0.02 or 0 0.10 as the maximum optical density that you can read from that negative, then only your test is valid. Same applies with positive controls. The positive controls are always included in ELISAs so that they give you the validity of that test. If you find like the positive test for this kid, it has to be ranging from 1.3 to 2.0, then you must get those ranges as part of your assay con and control or validity. So you must make sure always you meet the manufacturer instructions. If there are controls applied, they must be met according to their uh, levels. And sometimes some kids require you to calculate the cutoffs by introducing a factor. Like for example, the negative control is 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. Find the average of three, and add a factor of like 0 0.1 so that your cutoff becomes 0 0.1, 0 0.3. The reason why is sometimes there could be background that can be different from different populations or geographic locations. So by introducing that factor, you eliminate unnecessary uh, false, false positives so that you remain with clear negative. So these are some of the things. And within the kit, they have given out these factors. You're not going to imagine or think about them they are always provided. Now let's look at um, the, 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 the table there or the, the tube. The first one is the antibody that is immobilized, as you can see. Then you add your sample, allow it to incubate for one hour, wash, and an unbound or excess antigen uh, antibody is removed. Then again, wash, you remove 
any excess secondary antibody, sometimes we call it anti-human, and then allow the reaction by introducing a substrate which will react with the enzyme coupled with the secondary antibody. And finally, what you see when you add the substrate, you see the like a blue color, which is the enzyme usually used is um, uh, hydrogen pero uh, peroxidase, or sometimes uh, from phosphoradish, uh, which is very commonly used. And these enzymes act on tetramethyl benzidine or TMP to break it into a color that you can see. Uh, usually it's blue. But when you need to stop this reaction after a certain time, you need to add an acid. And now the acid changes the pH. So if it, your test was showing blue colors for positive tests or where there is a positive uh, reaction, then you see the, the, the yellow. Depending on the intensity of the reaction, you can see light to very intense yellow color. And that one is the basis of reading your optical density or ODs. Now, in direct ELISA, as the technique is known, this in this technique, the known antigen is attached to the inside surface of the well. Remember, in case of direct, you have the antibody immobilized such that it can capture the antigen from the sample. Now, for example, if I have antibodies against HIV, then I would have the antibody, like the, the antibody will capture certain uh, components of the HIV virus, like the P24 or GP120 for that reason. Now, in the indirect, you have the antigen immobilized on the surface of the plate, so that this antigen will now bind with the antibody that you find from the patient sample, and that will give you the antigen antibody reaction. And the procedure for washing and incubating is the same as the other one. So what is important here is that what are you capturing? Are you looking at detecting an antibody or are you looking at detecting an antigen? Okay. So the presence and the concentration of antibody that has reacted with the antigen is shown by the changing color, which I've demonstrated. And this depends on the concentration of the original antibody if it's the one under investigation. So some tests will show very intense, meaning like somebody who has been chronically infected, you expect to see high level of ODs or intense color, and as opposed to somebody who is just seroconverting. And that's why sometimes you have to request for a repeat of the sample. So the diagram below shows you the instrumentation. Of course, you need your sample, you need the equipment to read your ODs. And the plate down there gives you the appearance of the positive results. So different ELISAs, depending on which color they have used, they can give you different uh, uh, coloration, but you can always dis differentiate it from the negative, which is very clear wells without any color. Again, it's the positive one, which shows you like in this case, they, they look more brown color, okay? So your instruments must be serviced as well so that they give you the accurate results depending on the preventive maintenance schedule that might be available. Next slide, please. Now, there are many types of ELISAs. I want to highlight as you read it through even in textbooks. We can talk about direct ELISA where you, you need to identify the antigen and in that case, you have immobilized antibody. You have also indirect ELISA, whereby you have immobilized um, antigen. And in this case, this case, you are detecting the presence of an antibody. And then there is another one they call sandwich uh, ELISA, which you can have the, the antigen immobilized. is a modification of actually the, the indirect ELISA. Then you have the first antibody binding with that antigen, and then you have the secondary antibody. So the antigen is captured between two antibodies, and that's the word coming in the sandwich. So that is the, the differences between these ELISAs. And the most commonly used are the, the sandwich ELISAs that 
you can capture mostly in many 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 labs but they are all in existence you can use a direct eraser because each has its own um, challenges now whenever you read the results of eliza it is important to note in mind that if you are looking for qualitative eliza then you can look it using your naked eyes like the plate we have just seen you can see through the positive ones they look dark brown as opposed to the negative ones that are very clear wells so you can use your naked eye now if you are looking at quantitative antibody techniques then you need to measure the intensity of color in uh, under a uh, spectrometer or by spectrophorometer and that for that reason you need to have done dilutions so these dilution is usually they are done before you start incubating your plate so get the sample read the manufacturer instruction for that method that requires you to do the dilution so you can get a diluent included as part of the package for that uh, test which now you reuse to dilute samples because some manufacturers don't want mistakes to happen so to be on the safer side they provide the diluent as part of the kit package or the reagents that you are supposed to use however those that don't provide they can give you instruction that you need to dilute using this type of diluent whether it's a distilled water for that reason or it's normal saline they can give you the instruction but nevertheless the instructions will always be provided whether you need to dilute or not so it's something that goes under manufacturing instructions now um eliza has various advantages vis-a-vis these advantages. Now, part of the advantages is that uh, this can be automated and uh, sometimes uh, it becomes inexpensive. You can use small quantities required to do your assays. Now, the disadvantages comes in with the initial um, in, in investment that is it's expensive, especially for the beginners. So it's not that uh, cheap. It also has variable sensitivity and specificity of tests and sometimes can be affected by cross contamination. So how do you ensure there is no contamination and that's why people need training. The samples have to be collected on very clean containers or tubes and quality has to be maintained right from the patient preparation if the assay is done. And the, including the reporting of the results and sometimes it takes longer one day nowadays they are a bit more straightforward uh, elizas that like the fourth generation that takes last, like two hours or within two hours the results are released now another technique that is putting under primary is uh, binding uh, tests we talk about the radio immuno assay Actually, the principle is the same, antigen and body interaction. But what is used in terms of diagnostics is also what is different. Now, in this case of radio amino acids, you have, um, you need to detect the presence of an antigen or an antibody using um, radio labeled isotopes, which binds, it can be bound with an antigen or it can be bound with an antibody, depending on what is um, in, uh, desired in that particular uh, uh, test so whenever you see these differences uh, in terms of tests just bear in mind what reagents are used here otherwise the principle behind it is antigen and for the reaction but for you to see the reaction they use different um, reagents to bring out the signal you need to use for detection purposes. Now, the conventional radio immune assay is a competitive immunological procedure which measures very uh, low concentrations of antigens or antibodies by using radioactively labeled antigens as competitors. So, some of the commonly used radioisotopes we have uh, the carbon, the hydrogen, and, and so forth. These are just used to to be excited so that they can be easily uh, able to be 
give, to give out the visualization that is required for this uh, particular. And usually, these are not very commonly performed. These were the earlier, earlier tests that were performed be, before the current ones, but they are still important for uh, research purposes. Now, in um, in, in actual sense, this radio immunoassay is a highly sensitive method to detect uh, low concentration of animal or rather the amelable antigen. And this is applicable to detecting hormones, uh, drugs, enzymes, and microbial agents. So it can be used also for detecting other antigens like hepatitis B antigen, the calcinendronic um, antigen and also alpha beta protein. Remember, these are just tumor markers that can be very critical if you are investigating certain tumors or certain um, medical complications if somebody is suspecting of having cancer. That is the, the calcium the embryonic as well as the alpha beta protein. Those are very critical, especially if somebody is investigating about cancer cases. Now, this amino assay is also used for detection of an antibody. And then we have said you can label it an antigen or an antibody depending on what you want to check. So it has three components. First, you need a patient and antigen that is specific compound that you wish to determine. Then you need to have a labeled antigen, the same same antigen. Now it is labeled and it may be more placed. And this can be used to bind an antibody on either side. So the antibody will bind the labeled as well as the unlabeled. And that brings you the issue of visualization. So it's very, very simple as you may see it. That is what has been used. So it can be done in two phases. You can have it in liquid phase, maybe in a tube, or you can have it in a solid phase. For example, you can use a gel. Next slide, please. Let's, let's move on. So in liquid phase, the sample that is labeled antigen and the specific antibody are added to the mixture in solution form. And they say, this is in a tube. So always the antibody is there, your antigen is there, then you add it and mix them in a tube, which is now in solution form. Then after complete incubation, just for allowing this interaction between antigen and antibody to take place, then you can have the ligand of interest, that is the analyte bound free separation step is performed using different techniques. So you can uh, you can separate whatever that you, you are interested in. In liquid, I mean, in solid phase, this one you can have it done on, um, you can have it done either in suspension or you can have the antibody cover and be bound to the inside wall of the reaction tube. And this one will, kind of require some level of immobilization. So the tube has to be made in a such a way that you can have the antibody adhering or the antigen adhering to it. And then separation of the bound free uh, reaction is realized by centrifugation of all magnet magnetic separation followed by decanting the supernatant or simply polymorph the reaction mixture. So here the issue is that uh, there must be immobilization of this antigen or antigen uh, complex within the, the walls of the tube. And that is very, very critical. So that when you wash, you can still find the bound uh, antigens. And there are ways that this is done. There are some chemicals they can, they can use so that this can bind this antigen or antibody on the walls. Now there is uh, the southern floating named after the person who discovered the technique uh, uh, is named in uh, E.M. Southern 
and this deals with the DNA sequences. So I think you you remember from your even uh, molecular biology the issue about the southern and northern techniques. These are just uh, molecular techniques that are very very important in uh, genetic manipulation. So whenever this technique is used in clinical lab, its essence is to detect mutations that are known to cause a disease. So the the reason why we are bringing this here is under the detecting the antigen. Remember the DNA is part of the antigen or rather the, the pathogen. You can have the, the, the covering or the, the capsid in case of a virus, then you can also have the RNA or the DNA. So that is it. Now, uh, this is used to detect carriers, especially for fragile X syndrome and sickle cell anemia for genetic cancelling. So this method is commonly used for nucleic acid uh, testing for that matter because you are looking at the DNA for, for that reason. So let's look at the Western blot. As the name suggests, this one deals with uh, proteins. And now you have various proteins that are already known. They can be mobilized on a microcellular um, uh, 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 medium. And whenever you have your source of antibody, for example, your serum, you can uh, introduce it on one side of the nitrocellulose and then you allow it to um, move through. And for whatever reason, if there is an antibody that is corresponding to a specific antigen, you will obviously see a band that is formed. And then there is also the control that has to be uh, used, especially for validating your results. So if, it's, for example, HIV has different proteins, we have P17, we have P24, P55. So those are already immobilized on the nitro cell. So when you put your antibody, you would expect that uh, the corresponding antibodies will bind with these antigens and you will see different bands. You can see one band, you can see two or none if the test is negative. Okay, so that is it regarding Western blood. So the principle of this is that uh, antigens are separated by acrylamide gel, electrophoresis, and this sometimes can be transported onto a nitrocellulose nylon membrane. And then antibodies in serum can react with these specific antigens and this signals detection. And the, what you see is just a uh, the final product that you can expect to see under Western blood. Examples of these uh, pathogens that you can apply this technique, we have um, Cleponema peridium and many others, including HIV, we do not listed here, but any pathogen that is able to be detected as part of the research, because uh, all this can only be done through research, is when you can see whether you are technique is valid to detect that pathogen. Otherwise, if it's not, then you never uh, expect it to be a license to be used maybe in a clinical setup. So all these kits that are available, remember there is research that is going on in manufacturing companies that allows for detection of this, um, I mean manufacture, that allows for this research to give informed decision whether this kit needs to be developed and then it has to be approved by the appropriate body, and then it comes to the market. But those that are under research, they can only be found in the research environment. Okay. But there are many kits that you can find in research that are not in clinical labs. But there are other kits that you can find in both clinical lab and the research setting. So get to know that they start the difference. Now, agglutination is one of the techniques that is also very popular in immunology labs or in serological labs. Now, agglutination is very important because uh, it gives you simpler ways to perform your test and doesn't require special equipment and usually less expensive. So some of these uh, uh, applications of the agglutination they have been found their application in medical laboratories, 
and especially in demonstrating all the, the, the interaction between an antigen and antibody. Broadly speaking, um, agglutination is the clumping of cells into aggregates, often as a result of the combination of antibodies binding sites with the antigen binding sites of the cells. So from the antibodies, you have the Y-shaped or the, yes, the Y-shaped. So remember the two arms, they fuse together, they form one arm downwards. So the upper part, the two areas has antigenic determinants. They are antigen binding sites. And these are very important sites because like other immunoglobulins have two sites and others they have two, but when they fuse together, they make more binding sites like IgM, which very, makes it very uh, good, especially in uh, immunological responses. So um, in the secondary binding, agglutination can be performed on a slide. So you can get your slide, have your, your sample there, have your reagent, allow it to react, and you should be able to see agglutination with even your naked eyes. Sometimes it can be performed in tubes and it can also be performed in titration plates, just like the ELISA plates that we had seen earlier on. So there are many ways that this agglutination can be performed. Now, the slide agglutination test, this can be either the rapid and easily performable techniques. And you have seen even in um, performing um, certain tests, like for example, um, pregnancy test you 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 see people take a slide and produce the serum add the reagent and wait for a few minutes to see whether there is for open or estimation that they can be seen with the, even their naked eye sometimes you don't need a microscope now this rapid test gives you a reaction in a minute or sometimes even seconds not usually as sensitive as tube or micro titration techniques Specificity depends on the reagent used, okay? It can be active or passive. So when we talk about active, you can involve the, the antigen itself directly, or sometimes you can use the molecules that uh, like antibodies to detect the presence of an antigen, okay? Now, um, the slide uh, agglutination tests have been used to identify bacteria from cultures or that are difficult to standardize or control. And they can also be used to check auto agglutination or false agglutination. So these are some of the applications for the slide agglutination test. Now, passive agglutination slides, they, they look for specific antibody or known antigens is attached to inert particles. So when the non-antigen or antibody combines with its corresponding antibody or antigen in specimen or the particles, the cells are used only to show an antigen antibody reaction. So this is passive agglutination test or slide. It gives you some information. Yes, you are just checking whether there is a presence of an antigen or an antibody somewhere. So you must have the known antigen looking for an unknown antibody and the vice versa. So that is the application. And they are all in this reaction is therefore passive because you, you are not sure, you are just investigating, you are just trying to find out whether this is working or not. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the, the, substance, the, the, the substances that are very critical to this uh, test. We have the latex particles which are manufactured. Sometimes they can be used to couple antibody or antigen. Sometimes even they can be used to they can be used to attach the cells, like the red blood cells for some agglutinations. We also have the carbon particles. These are substances that are used to uh, link or couple with antibodies or antigens. And we have stabilized staphylococcal cells. So these are some of the, 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 the particles or molecules that have been utilized 
to bring out this agglutination uh, process into reality so that you can be able to see. Like for example, in the pregnancy test, we are using the latex particles to bring out the agglutination. You, otherwise, people can't use the, the other uh, animal things, so they are using the latex uh, particles. And they are quite used in many other immunological applications, uh, these latex uh, particles. Now, in tube agglutination, you have the, 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 the larger volume of fluid, and therefore in an environment that can be more controlled. Now, remember this agglutination, the antigen is in solid or in a particulate form, so that the antibody is in solution. So that is very critical to note when it comes to agglutination. But the other one, that it confuses with this is precipitation, whereby both the antigen and antibody are in solution form, but the principle is the same. So as I'm talking about agglutination, remember here we are dealing with a particulate antigen with an antibody in solution. While in precipitation reactions, you have both antigen and antibody in a solution, okay? All the antigen here is in soluble state. So that is it. Now, to add to what I'm saying, now when you talk about hemagglutination, what does that one mean? You are using red cells as part of your experimentation so that you can see whether this, there will be agglutination. The cells has to be crammed together or aggregated together to form something that is visible in form of agglutination. Now, when you talk about hemagglutination inhibition antibody test, even from the explanation, it tells you, you need to inhibit these cells from aggregating or from agglutinating. And in this case, certain viruses can cause about hemagglutination inhibition, meaning you can, uh, you can use it an antibody specifically, if you bind with this virus, they may not be able to cause or inhibit um, agglutination. So when you talk about hemagglutination, just remember that uh, you are using uh, the red blood cells as part of the investigation that uh, is very desired of a particular infection. So hemagglutination antibody test, in this case, the technique is used to detect antibodies against aboviruses, influenza viruses, measles viruses, and rubella. So what happens, in, even if you don't have an antibody, these viruses have the property to cause what? The, the red blood cells to agglutinate. So you have your source of infection, for example, your blood, if you have the viral infection from influenza, you add that serum onto the red blood cells that can be from the source animal, whether it's human beings or it's from the, 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 the other animals. Now this influenza virus will opt automatically cause agglutination or uh, cramping together of the red blood cells. But if you want to inhibit this virus, so in one well, then you can probably put an antibody against this virus in that well. So even if you add the red blood cells, because the antibody has already blocked these viruses, they will not be available to, to, to cause this agglutination. So in that case, the interpretation of the test is different from the other one that causes direct agglutination. If here you don't see agglutination, it might mean it's supposed to be test. So you must read each, each test in terms of how you interpret that particular test. Because some tests, they can cause hemagglutination, and some tests can cause inhibition of agglutination. So whenever you visit any lab and you find out this, the, the each, 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 each test has its own way that it's interpreted. Now, these viruses are able to agglutinate red cells because 
they possess hemagglutinins on their outer surface. So these hemagglutinins, actually, these are like antibodies that are able to bind with those antigens on the red blood cells and cause them to agglutinate. Because agglutinin is an antibody, but specific for a particular antigen. Okay. Like now in our blood system, we have agglutinins against the different antigens that we have. Somebody with blood group A has agglutinin B because it's on the other side of the, the, the blood group system. So you can check about these agglutinins as part of the antibodies that we have also within our uh, blood systems. Then this uh, imagglutination test can be um, reversible and passive for that reason. If you are not able to identify the virus that is under investigation. So that is it about the hemagglutination. And I remember where you have you applied. And I've said certain tests, like for example, in, in the pregnancy, you are not using red blood cells. So we talk about agglutination plain. But where you are using red blood cells, we talk about hemagglutination. So whenever we talk about inhibition, just remember you want to block the agglutination from taking place. So how do you block that? The reagent has to have that capacity to show you how to inhibit that uh, imagination. Now, precipitation reaction, I've said earlier on that this is a visible uh, reaction that uh, you may see out of antigen and antibody reaction. And that the major thing here is that both antigen and antibody, they are in soluble form. So and then it's highlighted here, the antigen here is what? It's soluble. So sometimes you have this happening in the in vivo system or in our bodies, and this enables the immune cells to recognize these minute antigen antibody complexes, and that helps better uh, recognition whenever they, 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 they form. So the antigen antibody molecules are bound together in a lattice or, or of alternate molecules if the reaction is, uh, is successful. And unlike our nation reaction, precipitation reaction involves more soluble antigen, which we have said. And when the antigen reaction occurs, a few small soluble lattice complexes form followed by a long period and are less visible than agglutination. So this can uh, be differentiated in terms of the magnitude. So while the agglutination is easily visible, you can even use your naked eyes, but precipitation sometimes you may not even be able to see with your naked eyes because it's a very slow uh, process. Now the, the uses of this precipitation reaction can be used to identify antigens in specimens or extracts and also in cultures. And they can also be very critical in quantifying the serum antibodies for that reason. So compared with agglutination tests, precipitation techniques require more experience in their performance and interpretation. Same tests have a low sensitivity. Now, low sensitivity meaning it cannot detect or pick something that is positive. It can report as negative because we say that Sensitivity is the ability of the kid to pick the true positives or the normal, while it is specificity is the ability to pick the true negatives. So here, when you talk about low sensitivity, it cannot pick somebody who is already positive for that particular uh, matter. It can be, this person can be reported as negative. So you can have, for his what? Negatives, that is it. Now, the, Types of precipitation, just like the agglutination, you can have tube precipitation test. You can have the gel, and you can have the counter immunofluorescence uh, test. So these are some of the methods or ways that you can demonstrate uh, precipitation tests, even though they are not that popular. They can have their own advantages and disadvantages. So I think um, 
we may not dwell so much on precipitation. Let's move to the next slide because the application is a little bit limited. Now let's look at the the gel uh, gel tests. Now, as all you are aware is that uh, you can make these gels even from your microbiology. There's a way you can prepare and make this gel just to demonstrate the different issues. But in case those are agars, but I'm talking about the ones that we are using for uh, UV um, identification. Now these are gels that are using these uh, like etidium bromide or for the acrylic gel and uh, the, the, the PGE uh, gels. These are very important because you have to introduce your sample, which has probably the source of an antigen or an antibody, then uh, subjected to UV light, then you should be able to see this. So these gels, they have a formula or an SOB you can use to prepare them. So they, they are also part of the serological tests that you can perform on account that they're using antibody antigen uh, tests. So we may not discuss about the, the preparation of the gels, but if you go to any molecular lab, the gels are being formed, I mean, prepared each and every time and you can get more information on how the gels can be prepared. Then uh, we have the other older technique, which we call um, um, gel diffusion. And this sometimes you can have the the, 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 the the different wells where you can introduce your antigen and where you can introduce your antibody. Then allow this gel for some time. Of course, the antigen and antibody will be diffused, and sometimes they might meet there and they form a certain line, and certain features will appear based on that interaction point. So these are some of the things that people refer as the ring when these two meet, and that can be visualized and they can be used to say whether somebody is positive or negative for a particular uh, technique uh, test. The other one is a counter current uh, electrophoresis, which is a kind of similar to, it's a modified form of a gel electrophoresis. I have no idea about this technique. I haven't seen it yet myself, but it is not different in terms of the principle. And there are many tests that you can always find that are coming on board. Some of them are yet even to be uh, uh, introduced in the market, but research is going on at the background. So these are some of the techniques that are utilized in visualizing this antigen antibody reaction. Now, the, the other test that is commonly used to some extent is the complement fixation test. Now, what is a complement? You remember even from your second year that uh, the complement, these are special proteins that act in a cascade way meaning the first one has to be activated then the second gets activated and so on. And this only gets activation by the virtue that there is either an antigen antibody interaction, especially like the, 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 the Kraski pathway where you have the immunoglobulin M or immunoglobulin G that is involved. And in that case, when there is that antigen antibody interaction, then the complement becomes activated and now there is a cascade of complement uh, proteins that are produced and activated with the smaller component the AB and, and the other component the T part and in that way you have this com uh, complement assisting or complementing an immunological response now how do we know how do you measure this complement on account of your theory is that uh, the complement can only be utilized whenever there is antibody antigen reaction. So the first point here is that in your test, you must have the source of uh, 
the complement, the source of an antigen, and the source of an antibody. Now, what happens here is that uh, if you expect the presence of a certain infection, then that means that in your reagents, probably you have your antibody immobilized on your plate, then you introduce the antigen maybe from the sample, then there will be antigen antibody complex formed. Now, in the next step, you expect to have the participation of complement because already the previous stage you have antigen antibody complex. Now the complement will be fixed or will be attracted to that particular reaction. Now in the next step, you have the red blood cells, which if the complement is not utilized in the previous stage, it will be available to cause hemolysis. So in this case, if you have the positive test, meaning you have the antigen present, it will bind with the antibody immobilized on your plate or on your reagent, and this will kind of utilize or will attract the complement. And in the next phase, even if you add the red blood cells, there will be no hemolysis because the complement is already utilized when there was antigen antibody complex. So when you don't see hemolysis, it is a positive test for a particular antigen because the complement was utilized as a result of antigen antibody reaction. Now, negative complement test is associated with hemolysis. Why hemolysis? If there was no antigen antibody complex, then you added your complement. The complement is available. Now you add the red blood cells. What happens? The red blood cell will be hemolyzed by the complement. So in hemolysis, it is a negative. If you see a hemolysis, it's a negative test for complement test. But if you don't see any hemolysis, it's supposed to test for complement test. So get the principle that uh, this can be utilized in looking at various um, uh, diseases, especially that can cause uh, problems, especially if not detected. So. I think you've gotten the principle of the complement fixation test. I don't need to explain it any longer from what I've just said. Now, the factors that may affect the antigen antibody complex, we have specificity. What is specificity? The ability of the test to pick the true negatives. So this is very common with antigen antibody uh, reaction and the URDs. We had mentioned it earlier. The cross reactivity because of shared epitopes by certain pathogens. For example, you talk about the, 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 the cross species or the cross um, closeness of certain pathogens. For example, the viruses, they have certain um, um, components they can share. If, for example, you have subtypes or, or subgenotypes for that reason. Then we talk about the temperature, it can affect what is the optimum reaction temperature for this particular organism or pathogen that can also affect it because some may require maybe interfered by low temperatures or high temperatures. Then the pH is also very important, the pH at which um, reaction will take place. So you might have to maintain. And that's why whenever we incubate even the or even when the, the reagents are made by the manufacturers, like this reagent, whenever you interact, you, you introduce your sample with the, this kit, incubate at 37. Why not 30? Why not 30, 49? There is an issue of the temperature that it has to be maintained. So, what is the room temperature? For example, when people read instructions, incubate this thing at room temperature. The room temperature in Kenya is not the room temperature in the UK, either in the US. So there must be specific degrees, whether it's at 33 or 34, that defines what room temperature is. Then uh, the ionic strength, uh, that is the interaction between the antigen and antibody, the concentration, 
of your reagents, and that's why I talked about dilutions if you need to, depending on the manufacturer instructions, because if you are required to dilute and you don't, chances are you are getting wrong results. Intermolecular specificity, and this also revolves around the antigen and for interaction. Then immunoprotein performance, this is our last topic we are looking at. Now, immunoprotein, what does it tell you? You have products of the immune system that you want to plot on a solid media. For example, you have seen us using reaction strips like the rapid kits. You use them to get quick results, but the principal area is immunoprotein. Now, these are performed on account of the following advantages that they are very, uh, they are used for discrepant results. Sometimes you may have two, especially whenever you increase the, the in terms of the, the bit of results. The rapid kids usually, if you have a minimum of two, the better. And that's why you always find like there are two kids. If, they give discordant result, then you need the third one as a tiebreaker. But sometimes it's good to go to ELISAs to confirm the same. It's uh, highly specific, and rapid kits are available. You can go there with me. Then the limitation is the cost, and sometimes the concern because of validated data. You know, where was this validated? You need to consider into various backgrounds and, and so forth. So each laboratory is tasked to check all this information before it uses the results. Now, the principle for this immunoplots, what is common is immunochromatography, whereby a dye is labeled specific for a particular antigen and is present on the lower end of the nitrocellular strip or in a plastic well provided with the strip. And these are common things we see with these rapid kits. So as you introduce the antibody, there is already immobilized antigens at different uh, points or, uh, or, or, or labels, and these are already known. So when you introduce your sample, the sample has to kind of move through these uh, bound antibodies, and if it finds a corresponding antibody, it will be trapped in that particular area. So there is also a test line that is used for making the kit uh, with the test uh, to be valid. So you must always find a line forming on that particular band. So if it does not form, then you discard. That is invalid results. So you must have at least the control line has to appear. And if there are two lines, then that tells you whether somebody is positive and so forth. So this is very common, especially with quick tests or point of care tests. And I think that gives us uh, more understanding on what some of you have been involved. You, are, uh, you know, most of us have gone through this HIV test or rapid test personally, or you have done it to somebody else, for those who might be privileged to be working in, in a clinical center. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, this immunochromatography uh, has the following applications. The advantage is that they are commercially available, single use rapid test, depending on the high, whether they are sens highly sen uh, sensitive or specific, they are easy to perform and they can detect an antigen or an antibody. And they can be used in the field, and that's why we, we refer them as point of care. You know, you don't need sophisticated uh, tests. The limitations are the cost and the concern, as we have said. So these are some of the things that uh, we wanted to look at. And I've put you for you some uh, review questions just to remind yourself what you have learned. Write the difference between precipitation and agglutination. I think I've even just talked about this. How does the zonal reaction affect test results. Now remember, I said yesterday that uh, for certain ELISAs you need to dilute 
others you are not supposed to dilute. The principle is when you have antigen and antibody in equal proportion, you expect to see a good reaction or a good performance of the test. And that can be able to be uh, to give you the results or the, the, the sensitivity or specific that you need. But remember, if you don't dilute when you are supposed to, that meaning that means you are going to have excess antigens or excess antibodies. And for any ELISA, there is what we call Brozon effect. Whenever you have equal volume or equal concentration of antigen and antibody, you expect the, the, the reaction to be optimal. So when you have antigen in excess or antibody in excess, they might not be strong binding. And remember the, the, the figure I had shown you that this antibody antigen reactions are reversible. So when you don't have optimum concentration of either antigen or antibody, remember you have antigen, yes, you have antibody, yes, but there's no interaction. So that immunocomplex will not be detected and you don't want to lose that. So the proson effect is to make sure that the antigens and antibodies are reacting almost in equal proportion and that gives you the reaction that can be visualized and you can be able to give the accurate results in terms of detection. Okay, right, the advantages and disadvantages of serological tests compared with other laboratory techniques for infectious diseases. Now, there are other tests. For example, what is the advantage of this serological over the molecular techniques or over the other techniques that are used in the market over, like, for example, microscopy? Why are you interested in looking at serology or the products rather than the actual pathogen? So those are the minor things that you can think about. But I've covered the serological tests, the principles, which is almost the same, but the methods are different. It's your time now to go and read on the same test that we have looked at, but above all, visit any lab so that you can see this test where they are being done, and that will be good for you. You are free to consult any time. We have immunology lab, which you can come and get this explained further as the practical uh, that may help you uh, grasp with this idea. Otherwise, thank you so much for your patience, especially for today. Great, Doc. Thank you so much for the class and the questions. Um, we will have our class next week again with you. Okay, fine. So uh, share this with the rest. And yes. They, they, they get it. But if there is anything that is not clear, I'm available now on an individual basis. I'll be happy to help you. Which is very nice, Doc. We appreciate it. Okay, fine. Thank <laughs> you.